ready for Thanksgiving? <laughs> I'm not quite ready. It's an early Thanksgiving this year, but that's great. That means we get a bonus Sunday next week, which means I get to preach twice as, twice as long, I think. So that's fabulous. When I was in seminary in Kansas City, I was, I think, as poor as I've ever been. So there wasn't a lot I could do, but dates were important. And hey, we were already driving home from work, so we're already out, right? So we found uh, a place we could afford and went to as much as we could. It's called the Nelson Atkins Museum of Fine Art. And the reason we could afford it is because they had Ford Free Fridays. So we went there, and they have, you ever been there? They have these huge um, badminton um, birdies out in the lawn. It's a piece of art, and it's fun, and it's, you take your picture next to the thing, and I have a picture of my wife, very pregnant, with Stella in there, and you can see the big birdies in the background. I brought a, a different picture to share with you. One of the places as we went in, I was so impressed to see, was a relief. It was a, a, a carving. Usually they did it, they either carved or they did them in clay. And I'm not sure about this one, but, but as I turned the corner and looked, it was beautifully lit. It was a wall relief, and it showed um, a scene from the kingdom of Assyria. And this was in the 800s, just a little before Jonah's time. And it was so impressive. It's about as big as I am and um, beautifully done. And if you look closely, which you can't because I know it's a photo, there's cuneiform written all over this thing. All this lettering, all the exploits of the great mighty king and everything else, you know, they put all over those things. And obviously it's lasted 2,800 years, something like that. And it made it to the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. I went to another one, New York City, the Met, and they had other ones there. And, and um, it was just a reminder to me that this civilization that no longer exists, Assyria, was, was so great that people are still looking back on history to see and understand what happened. And of course, a city can be great for good or bad reasons. <laughs> Notorious is a word we use for somebody who's great for bad reasons. And Syria, Syria was both um, great and notorious. But I wanted to share that with you because it's possible that Jonah saw this carving where he was at when he went throughout the city of Nineveh um, or the other one. Um, so we hear God tell them that Nineveh was a great city. And uh, we're, we're looking through the story of Jonah in the Old Testament I love this book. It's one of my favorite in the Old Testament. Last week, Dave preached a wonderful message about what happens when we quit on God. And does he quit on us? And he asked that question that we have probably all asked ourselves at some point in our life. Does God want me back? What tremendous grace we saw in the heart of God through a rebellious Jonah who did the opposite of what God asked him, and yet God still reached out for him and he wanted more than just a prophet, just, why don't you just do what I've told you, you know? He wanted Jonah's heart, and he wanted Jonah to see his heart. And Jonah did, and he proclaimed God's greatness there in the, the stomach of that great fish. And then he was vomited up, it says in some translations. Jonah got a second chance, and here we are to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah has a second chance So in chapter 1, God said to Jonah, go. And Jonah said, no. He went the other way. If you go to that slide for us, Kev. And then in the, in the, 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 um, the, the belly of that great beast, God asked Jonah, see? Do you see this? Do you see what's going on? See my salvation? And Jonah said, yes. And he sang the praises of God. By his own salvation, he saw the loving, saving heart of God. Then we come to chapter 3, and God calls again to Jonah. He gives a new command. Chapter 3, would you stand with me in honor of God's word? We can ask God to bless the reading he has for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word that is as old as Jonah, and some of it goes way back before then. We ask you to bless our hearts today as we hear from it, that we would hear from you, not just English words or a faithful translation of Hebrew words, but your words for us, so we can have your purpose in us today and this week, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. <laughs> 
Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a great a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> this is an amazing story, isn't it? It starts with the amazement that Jonah actually did what God called him to. That was awesome. Then he purposed himself. He went all the way to Nineveh, and he actually did the thing. He preached. Uh, he proclaimed the news of God's judgment to them, Nineveh. And, and then Nineveh turned to God. They turned their hearts away from their evil and turned towards God. And then God relented. What an amazing story. Now, this would have taken some time. Nineveh was, Nineveh was some distance from Jonah, and also the city itself was huge. The mount upon which it sat was 60 feet high, and the, the wall could be ridden on by three charioteers abreast each other. It had richly ornamented public buildings, parks, and meadows in the outlying areas, and some people say it was the greatest city of its day. I can say the wall they excavated was nearly eight miles around. It was not a small city. People began turning to God. And as we read the story, we can see first it was the people. Then the word rose to the king. It sounds like Jonah never got to actually preach to the king. He just heard from the people, and the nobles did too, and so they issued a decree for all to fast and repent. There was a citywide revival. When I first heard this, I was wowed by it. When I thought I knew a lot a little later, a young adult, with just enough uh, knowledge of languages and history to be skeptical, I gave the story a little side eye. You know, I thought, well, huh, did that really happen? You know, that sounds a little too good to be true. Anybody thought that when you read that this time or another time? Right? Because it's not like Jonah's practiced up here, right? The king proclaimed a fast for this strange God, Yahweh. The whole city turning to him. And there isn't even Assyrian records of this. Plus, we know that Assyrians turned again, back against the Lord and his people with violence. So there's no long-term evidence, right? So when I read this later, I thought, I don't know about this. Now, you might notice about me as preacher that I do care about skeptics' questions, uh, very much so. I've found that God can handle all our hardest questions, so can the Bible. Um, I, it started when I was a young, a young adult, and I heard about postmodernism, how scary that was, and you know, questioning truth and all this kind of stuff, and I realized there's good truth to be had. There's lots of information out there, even before the internet age, when it ruined all the information. Sorry, I sound like an old-timer. Get off my lawn, right? Um, so like all these questions came up and, and for me, I really, I went digging deep to find answers and I just tell you, I just want to tell you that um, keep seeking the Lord and keep digging and you'll find answers. And God has answered most of my questions. Some satisfactorily, some still working on, but I see some of the answers and um, I, I sense good answers. And I've found some interesting things about this with Jonah. And I'm just going to take a, a moment with this because it, it's not the main point of today, but First of all, the idea that the whole city might turn to God in repentance, guess what? That's actually what they did back then. People were collectivist in their understandings. Families had the same religion. 
nation states had the same religion. Sometimes the king proclaimed something and everybody just, okay, <laughs> you know, we're going to do this thing now. I guess this is what we're doing. Now, that's not how it happened here in Jonah because it kind of rose up to the king. And he was one of those kings that was like leading the parade from the back end, you know. Hey, we're doing this thing. All right, you know. But um, people did stuff together all the time, even religious, even change, repentance. That's how they rolled. So, yeah, that's absolutely how they did things. Secondly, the king proclaimed a fast for the strange god Yahweh. That seems kind of unique, but they weren't always loyal to their gods. <laughs> You look at what happened with the sailors in chapter 1. They were totally devout in terms of passion, right? But they were not devout in terms of loyalty. <laughs> they each, it says in Jonah 1, they each prayed to their own God, right? Then after that, they made sacrifices to Yahweh, and we're glad they did. But it's actually something that people in that day did, more than just what we're hearing in here in Jonah. And then the third question, if Assyria turned to God wholeheartedly, and then later turned back away from the Lord, would we expect to find records of it? There's a lot of cultures that actually destroyed records of all kinds of things. I saw a Netflix special on a tomb, and you could see <laughs> scratching over the old record was the brother or the nephew or somebody that wanted to change the records on the family history. That happened all the time, too, so we shouldn't necessarily expect it. And, um, and the fact that Assyria turned away from God later that Nineveh, I should say, Nineveh turned away from God back to their violence. That's not proof of anything because Israel did that same thing as well. So the fact that this seems a little unusual it doesn't mean it's impossible or it didn't happen. It means it's noteworthy and we're glad they recorded it. And if you remember the kinds of signs that people would find important to look to God, um, things like earthquakes and famines. And if you compare that to the whole historical record around Jonah's time, you might be surprised to see how many of those signs and wonders were happening in that day, even though Jonah did not record it. In the 700s BC, there was more than one solar eclipse. There was earthquakes, riots, famine, and flooding. It was a troubling time in Nineveh in many, in many periods. And so they all assumed these were heavenly signs. Even the point about fasting water, there was flooding. And that is something that you do when there is flooding. You are very careful with water. So apparently Nineveh was ripe for repentance, and Jonah had no idea. Anybody ever been late to the party on God's plan? <laughs> the fields were wide into harvest, as Jesus would later say, and God was calling a harvest worker. <clears throat> Jonah didn't know that, but he didn't need to. He just needed to trust God. They repented, and they were saved. It was a miracle, a miracle of humanity. So Jonah gave Nineveh 40 days, and then he made a three-day preaching plan, and he was done in one. <laughs> That's what happens if you read through this chapter. They repented in sackcloth and ashes, they repented. Verse 10 says, God saw them, <clears throat> saw they turn from their wicked ways. The people repented, so God relented. Our God turned from his promised judgment and instead forgave them. Now this brings up a vital question of a, from the Old Testament that's very appropriate here and other places. And that is, did God ever change his mind? Perhaps we can look at Jonah's wording to mean something a little bit differently than what it looks like to us. Or perhaps he didn't say what God wanted him to. I don't know. We just hear Jonah promising, promising destruction, right? Judgment. And then they repent, hopefully, hoping that God would relent and that they would be saved from destruction. And we look at this thing and wonder, what happened? Did Jonah get it wrong, or did God change his mind? And that's a good question for us to ponder. I have a scripture for you that I brought that I think can help us with this question, and that is Jeremiah 18, 7 through 8. This is God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil then I will relent 
and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. Jeremiah spoke that to Israel. Israel had times of turning back to God, but then eventually they went into exile. But it sounds like a pretty open promise, doesn't it? Here God tells them if he's announced destruction to a nation or a kingdom, and we'll just say a city, capital city, whatever you want to put in there. And if that nation repents of its evil, then I will relent. That sounds like a promise, right? So this is exactly what happened, and I think, I think it's a good explanation. Some scholars call this conditional judgment. That conditional judgment was promised. And it helps me sometimes when I'm reading through the Old Testament and I hear God saying, I'm going to destroy, you know? And then he repeats himself and repeats himself. And I go, okay, we get the message here, Lord. And then it hits me. Wait a second. God is offering something here and he's patient. He's offering to relent if they would just turn. And it's amazing if you get into the Hebrew because Jonah promised the city that it would be overthrown in verse 4. And that's an interesting word. The Hebrew word is hepek, and it means a reversal, a change, a deposing of royalty, a change of heart. It means a whole lot more than violent destruction like we might think. Instead, their hearts had a reversal, a big change, a prostration of the royalty, including all the nobility, and an entire change of heart. I just want you to know, I didn't write this translation of the word here today, to, to apply to this passage. This is just the key word that you look all through Scripture in the Old Testament. These are the basic ways it gets translated. And I thought, what a beautiful symbolic word of what Jonah promised. Friends, if we repent, God will relent. And that's a promise for us here and for anybody we see and run into. Even whole cities. I know it's rare, but it happens. Other whole cities have repented. Savonarola in the 1450s led a citywide revival of Florence, Italy, which was depraved. Some of the excesses of the Renaissance, you can just imagine, they were a part of, of um, that city. It was horrible. And yet they turned. And you might remember a couple of names that came from that, whose hearts were inspired and changed. Michelangelo and Botticelli. The whole city turned. Another one. Sometimes we hear stories of kings turning. The great Christian Ambrose, according to tradition, <clears throat> he required Emperor Theodosius to repent before coming back to church and receiving communion because Theodosius had massacred Thessalonians and Ambrose of Milan stood his ground and the king repented and came back to church on his knees. There's famous paintings of this. I wanted to tell you about one specifically, St. John Chrysostom. He is called Saint, he's called John the Golden-Tongued. And I just found out this week, he was at the Golden uh, Basilica, I think was the name, because of, of how it was ornamented. And so he lived at a time when it was only the 400s, but many Christians were rich. Many Christians were already leaders. And, and he preached against the excesses of their riches. And there was... Um, he, he, became, he was golden tongue, so he was a beautiful preacher. Anybody's preached, you've quoted St. John Chrysostom. Pretty awesome dude. Um, but they were rebelling in this moment. <clears throat> His city was rebelling <clears throat> excuse me, against the emperor. They were upset. And some of them started defacing imperial statues. And I don't care <laughs> what period of history you live in, if you, if you uh, mess with the statues of somebody who's alive or related to the ones who are alive, they're going to come calling. And that's certainly what happened. Um, the, the empire sent some officials and they um, imprisoned some of the, 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 the city officials and they um, executed others. So in the midst of all of that fear, the archbishop of that city, Flavian, he rushed to the capital, Constantinople. 800 miles he went to beg the emperor for clemency. And in that time, St. John Chrysostom, as he's called, he urged the people to pray to God for real change. Here he is uh, turning around to the, apparently in some churches they had, uh, what do they call those? Those booths, the peanut gallery, whatever, you know, where the rich would be seated as Christians, but also in displaying their wealth and preached against the excesses of dress that some people wore, the excesses of riches that people flaunted. 
asking people to take care of the poor. And uh, he urged everyone to pray to God for real change, not as, he says, when during one of the numerous earthquakes or in famine or drought or in similar visitations, you leave off your sinning for three or four days and then beginning the old life again. They listened, they prayed, they repented, and eight weeks later, Flavian returned with good news, and the city was not destroyed. It's happened lots of times, lots of places, and uh, it happened here with Jonah. And uh, I can't wait to get to next week, because as Dave said last week, if you end the Jonah at the end of, of any one chapter, you'll get a slightly different feel. So there's a twist coming, and I urge you to come back next week. Now, you might wonder, what does all this have to do with me? <laughs> Again, I'll repeat what was said last week. God gives second chances. And so that's for us and for anyone we run into, even to ones with cold, dead, hard hearts. God gives second chances. That's why Dave said repentance feels good. <laughs> now, I know on Sunday mornings we like to have inspiration and just good news, right? Right? For the most part. <laughs> but we never want to ignore a hard truth. And uh, experts who study religious trends have seen many turn away from Jesus and the church in the last decade. You tracking with me? So many have turned away that they call it the great de-churching. De-churching. I didn't realize how big this was until I heard some of the statistics. Um, so many have stepped away from Jesus and the church that this is now considered the single biggest religious change in America's history. And that's sobering, because you think of the first great awakening, which happened before we were a nation, but while we were here and in Europe. And then the second great awakening, which happened in the 1800s. And those are huge religious changes. And the historians are saying now this rivals those in terms of change over a period of time. And that's sad. And so let's think about causes for just a moment. Now there are still some on the other side of the church live stream camera. And we just want to invite you back. If you haven't come back, come on back. We'd love to see you every Sunday. Some have gone so all in on traveling for sports for their kid, they've walked out in church and haven't come back. Some have traded the worship of Almighty God for the worship of political figures and parties. Some have seen the church fight so hard about secondary things that they've walked away. And I heard this week a man tell me about his son doing just that in our state. And we can certainly look for causes, but we don't want to throw stones. You know, we want to be wide-eyed wide and our God is a God of hope. And as we know that and as we live that, we are blessed as his people. There's a book by Graham, Davis, and Burge that say the top reasons that people have left church in the last decade are more casual than a lot of those. Um, a change of priorities for many. If you could pull up that slide for me. Church is competing with four things. Streaming, sleeping, scrolling, and sports. Now, none of those are evil things, right? We've all seen the excesses of those things, haven't we? <laughs> I like that I can remember four S's. That's great. Some have moved and just haven't started going to a new church. Now, here's the interesting thing. 50% of those who are considered de-churched will come back if we invite them. That's what these experts say. And they've done a lot of phone calling to get to that, including 67% people of color. All we have to do is invite them. Now, some of those who won't come back will come back. They just need a little bit more than an invitation. Some of them need a sit down, you know, coffee time or lunch to talk about something that maybe is hard, but they just have to hear from somebody who cares and get a question answered. And some may never return, but it's actually fewer than you think. The good news is inviting someone to church for, for most people isn't a deal breaker for friendships. This is one of the things they asked people over the phone. They were asking strangers. You know, if, some, if a friend asked you to come to church, would you end that friendship? 
And most people said no. And so, you know, that's one of the things we're afraid of. It'll change the relationship, you know. And I was surprised to see that. So a few more pieces of good news. Many of those who have turned from the church have already met Jesus. It turns out that almost 40% of spiritually open non-Christian Americans have already made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ in the past. So they already know something about him, and they've already made a commitment to him. They just turned away from that. Now that surprised me that it's that many. But when you think about it, maybe not. Another thing is most Americans view Jesus favor- favorably, even now. Some just need to see Jesus and his people. This is uh, Barna's stat. I'll share something next week, I think, from that. Some of us just need to be seen. We just need to be heard from. You know, through the pandemic, it was easy to hide away. Anybody, just to be honest, they hid away a little bit. (laughs) In fact, a recent study on corporate offices found within the last year that corporate offices were still less than 20% back. I couldn't believe it. That, so the occupancy rate was still less than 20% around a year ago. That's how few people have come back to their corporate job office. And so that tells me people are commuting less, so they have a little more time. That's great. And you know what? They need relationships like we all do, relationship with God and with others. So there's a lot of good news in this that I see. Many people are waiting for an invitation. If you're like me, your dad told you at some point in time, you're waiting for an invitation? (laughs) My answer was always no, but it turns out that, um, yeah, a lot of people are. They're waiting for an invitation. They don't want to go to just any church. They want to go to church where someone cares about them. And if you invite them, that's a great start. And uh, a pastor can invite someone, but it really means something if someone they know invites them. Or a complete stranger you run into and and just start talking and they realize that God has something for them in your church. Now I can tell some of you have been inviting friends and neighbors and I just want to say keep it up. And uh, for the one I heard recently who shared um, the love of Jesus with one of his neighbors, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Now I just want to end all of this with a very practical thing. How can we share the good news of the gospel of Jesus? Well, there's lots of ways, and uh, I I put this together for us today. Um, Four parts. The first one is creation. Our story as humans starts with creation. We were created in the image of God to thrive in his good world. And so Genesis 1.28 says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. And the word subdue can mean something violent, but it also just means like farm the ground, you know, turn over the dirt, plant stuff, and eat from it. And so gardening is kind of the, what we were supposed to do as we filled the earth. We're supposed to make it useful to, his, to God's glory. And so thriving is a part of God's creation for humanity. It has a beautiful start. And then the next part is rebellion. We know that humanity very quickly rebelled sinned and turned from God. And so Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. So the first parents we had, they sinned, and also we've all sinned. Through sin, death entered all creation. And that explains why life is rough, why we have so many problems. But there's good news, and that is salvation. By Jesus' death on the cross, we can be forgiven. I like John 3, 16, but when I picked it, I forgot it had the same word perish that was in Jonah. So that was great. Maybe we won't perish, the king says. All right. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Salvation. All we need to do is repent of our sin and confess Jesus as Savior. By Jesus' death, we have life. And then four, redemption. Through the Holy Spirit, we can have new life to thrive in his purpose now and be with Jesus in heaven. Romans 8, 11 says it this way. And if the spirit who raised, of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. And so we look forward to heaven, but also heaven come down, new creation that God has put in the hearts of his people. So I just want to conclude all this this way. If you use that, great, I'm glad. If you have another way of sharing the gospel with someone else, great. However you would do it, the point is that we remember and that we're ready to share whatever Jesus would have us share, to share his love with others around us. I just want to say, as we're looking back on Jonah, God sent Jonah after preparing the hearts of the ones who would hear it. He was the messenger. His message was nothing special, (laughs) just the truth. And he only made it a third of the way through his plan, through the city, before the people began to repent in full. It was huge. Nineveh repented, so God relented. And Jonah saw their salvation. This, I think, is the biggest miracle in the book of Jonah. There have been mighty moves of God through history. And many of us can testify, we have seen God move in us and around us. We've seen his power. So we want to pray together. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. You know, that new life and redemption I spoke of, we live out of thanks. And so this season of thanksgiving is a wonderful time to remember. I just want to challenge us out of that abundance of appreciation we have for God and his grace. I want to challenge us today, sometime this week, to share the name of Jesus with someone you've never talked to about spiritual things before. Invite Jesus into your conversation. See what he does. This season of thanks is a perfect time to do just that. I want to ask our worship team to come and let's bow our heads and our hearts. Heavenly Father, It's so easy for us to thank you for your gifts. And the greatest gift we could ever thank you for is salvation. For us, for our loved ones, and for everyone here on earth. Lord, you continue to offer it. Lord, I heard heard, um, good news from Australia as people are not trusting government as much in the last five years, but trusting religious institutions more. That's amazing. Lord, I heard good news from another culture that's immigrating to the U.S. um, And the revival that's happening in them, both there and here, is just amazing. So I just want to say with them and with all of us here today, thank you. May we live with hearts of praise and thanksgiving towards you. And we ask these things together in Jesus' name. Amen.